The morning of March 21st, 1968 was a fine morning. I was 79 years old and felt and looked 30. The sun woke me up that morning, or so I thought. Sometimes the African sun sneaks over the horizon like an old lion on the prowl, the mist diffracting its rays into a mane. I awoke as if I had been tickled on the nose with the hair of that mane. The silence was like a breath on my face. It was a silence that had quietly awakened me. The winning of horses, the bellowing of cattle, the squawking of chickens, the chittering of monkeys were compressed within the lungs and sealed by mouths afraid to open. The voices of the cooks, house servants, and yard men were there, but noiseless. It hung in the sky, turned to cold blue air. I could sense them fluttering the windpipe. Fear, or stealth by some, and fear of others. Treachery, perhaps. Jomo Kenyatta had said that I was the only white man that he had ever respected. What he meant was, feared. During the so-called Mau Mau Revolution, he told his men to stay away from me. His own tribe, the blacks who had initiated me with their bloodletting and buggery into their tribe, who accepted me as their chief, hated the Agutu, and they loved me. Not as a brother, but as a demigod. They would have died to the man to defend me. Besides, Kenyatta knew that though I was white, I was even more African than he. After all, I was adopted and raised by the folk. My blood brothers and warriors, the original tribesmen, had almost all died off. The survivors were creaky boned white hairs. I had been given a choice of becoming a citizen of this African state and declaring the source of my wealth or getting out. Old Kenyatta felt strong enough now to send that ultimatum. Even though he was no longer the titular head of the state, his voice was behind the order. I had refused to do either, and so I had waited. But I had waited so long for action to be taken that I had become a little careless. The sun was no longer an old lion. It was the red eye of death, the drunken, always dry sot who thirsted for me for almost 80 years. Now the red eye was bisected on my penis, which reared with a piss heart on. I was lying on my back naked, and the scarlet ball climbed up the shaft and was on its way to being balanced atop it. From some distance there was a click. The sky was ripped as if it were rotted old cloth. The sun was atop of the head of my penis, seeming almost to spurt out. I knew what the ripping sound was the moment I heard it, and I knew what the click had been. As if it were a red sea, the sun burst open from my penis. It disappeared into smoke. The walls flew apart as if they become a flock of cranes, disturbed by an eagle. The sun poured into me and filled me through the backs of my eyeballs. The noise squeezed out of me. I was turned inside out like a glove. I was a tuning fork trying to find its resonance. The first shell may have struck just outside the bedroom window. The second shell may have exploded at the end of my bed. That one of those freaks and coincidences has caused me to mock my biographer. That had actually happened to me. The blast lifted my spring and my mattress and me upward, backwards, and out the window behind me. I must have landed in a pile of wood and plaster and bricks, and I was still on my mattress, which was by what was left of the veranda. I had crawled slowly out of the pile like the naked body of a tortoise, working through its shattered shell. I felt, I felt, but I could not hear the, the other shells. None of these came close enough to damage me, but they, but they must have been striking other parts of the house. Through the smoke I could see the stone foundations. These were sending off chips of stone, and also pieces of wood were breaking off and flying into the air. Machine guns and rifles were trying to shred away all the stone and the bricks and the mortar and the wood, and anything of flesh which the shells might have missed or failed to utterly destroy. Rock fragments struck me in many places. I was half stunned, but I had one thought. That was to get to the refuge prepared for such an emergency. More smoke poured over, obscuring my vision and making me cough. I had, however, seen that the thin smoke shell, which actually a doorway, an exit through the refuge, was split open. I reached inside the portion of the foundation, still standing, felt the steel handle, turned it and slid inwards. Even as I closed the door and swung it hard, propelled by a bullet, I was in the darkness and in utter silence. I groped around until I found the oxygen bottles and cracked them to make sure I had sufficient supply. I couldn't hear the hissing, but I felt the nozzles and cool air struck my palm. I decided to use the lamp for a moment and examine the room. It was a box 12 feet by 12 feet by 8, stubble walled steel with fiberglass insulation between the walls. It contained oxygen bottles, 5 gallons of distilled water, medical supplies, some cans of food, pistols, two rifles, and ammunition. The main entrance was through a trap door in the bedroom above, but the two small exits could be used as entrances. The refuge had been built 30 years before, 
and updated now and then, hence the fiberglass stuffing. I had built it at my wife's insistence, who had pointed out that we would have been safe a number of times if we had had the refuge. So, I built it, and it had not been used until now. In fact, I had almost neglected replacing the empty oxygen and water bottles over aged cans. I hope that no one outside there knew about the box. Since it had been built, I had taken great pains to get the stores into it unobserved, and to never speak of it to anyone except my wife. If the enemy got hold of an old banjo eye who remembered it, the old one would have talked and I would be as helpless as an elf in a pit. While I crashed in the corner, I discovered that I had spread a jism over my right leg. This probably occurred when the first shell exploded. Hemingway and his imitator Rurok are usually full of shit when they speak of Africa, whereas the Yankees say they don't know shit from Shinola. But they were sometimes accurate in their observation of animals, particularly leopards, shooting spur at the moment of violent death. Ejaculation is a form of protest of the body against death. Cells want to live forever. They will try to impregnate the air in desperate population, perpetuate themselves when faced with the end. That is my explanation. I personally do not fear death, but my cells are not as rational as I. What women do at the moment of suffering a violent death, I do not know. I've never heard of a woman shooting out an ovum. Perhaps they do this, but the egg is so small it's unnoticed. Of course, there are so many days when no egg is available, and a man always has sperm. It's possible that women substitute voice for sperm, their ejaculations or screams. I waited in the corner. The box was dark. Now, because I had turned out the lamp, conserved the battery. The silence continued for a long time. I had a sharp headache, which I endured for some time, and then took two aspirins to relieve. The relief did not come. From time to time, I felt a very couple vibrations of explosions against my back. These, I imagine, were direct hits. The enemy certainly believed in overkill. To use a cannon against one man seems superfluous, but it was also guaranteed to destroy me entirely. Like so many guarantees, it was worthless so far. One or more of the direct hits must have blasted away outer steel wall. Another direct hit removed the fiberglass in the inner wall. I felt as if I was buried under tons of dirt, and I lost consciousness. I think we'll listen.